Hello everyone, welcome to another stream with Hatch. It's been a long time since uh, the last time we streamed together, maybe a bit less than two weeks. Um, we are going to do something quite unique and interesting uh, right about uh, four minutes from now. I'll tell you in a moment. Just want to make sure that the stream is working and everything is fine. Excuse me for a bit. Okay, seems like it's working. So, okay, the plan for today is uh, quite interesting. Um, you can see the setup over here. I have the camera, this is quite obvious. Below the camera you can see the board, which is blindfolded in a way. I cannot see the pieces. And on the, let's call it left side of the screen, you will actually see what he can see, which are the pieces. And uh, we're going to go through some of his uh, older games uh, played uh, in chess.com in the past month or so and uh, it's gonna be quite interesting so I'm looking forward how this is going to unfold I'm going to mention that I have two boards uh, open at this point uh, one is the blindfolded one and another one just in case uh, I cannot see the, the position anymore then I will just move to the visual board that you see on the left which is also open on my computer and I'll of course mention it and we'll continue the analysis from there so uh, obviously uh, me being blindfolded is not the main part of the stream this is just a challenge that's gonna be interesting to face uh, the main part is for us to be educational and uh, to learn from his mistakes and to, to go through the games and um, even though he sent me the games uh, a few uh, minutes before the stream, I really didn't have time to, to go through them. And um, I feel like uh, every single move that I will see or not see, visualize, is going to be the first time I'm facing it. But um, just a, a heads up, with the first three games, I went extremely quickly through them from beginning to end. Uh, I don't remember really what happened, but uh, I didn't have time to look at the others. So over here we already uploaded like uh, nine games into the stream. You probably cannot see it, but... Um, so we can see there, there's already a notation on the right. So it's going to be visual for both of us. And um, let's see. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Let me pop out of here. Uh, can we hear over talk real quick? Because I want to get the levels just right. Yes, sure. So. Can you speak yes. how you would normally you? speak, like close to the mic and everything there? Yes, I, I can kind of uh, hear myself. Can you hear talk real quick? Because I want to get the levels just right. Yeah. There's a little yes, bit of an sure. echo. Yeah, a little bit of an echo. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's from my end or not. But maybe there's something open here. So. Okay, okay. Is there still an echo? Okay. So let me see if there's any window. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, now it's okay. 
Yeah, on your stream was open somewhere. I didn't even notice. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, someone up just put it in the chat and some somehow it automatically played. So yeah. Anyway, um, so the okay, yes. Yeah, so yeah, so today uh, we're going to look at your uh, chess.com games that you played. What uh, time control was it, by the way? Okay, so pretty decent, decent amount of time, which is good. Uh, I recommend everyone who wants to improve to play 10 minutes at least for each side with increment if possible. Um, and uh, well, the idea is that we're gonna go through the games and we are going to analyze them and, and uh, suggest ways to improve while repeating uh, things we mentioned in previous streams. And uh, the trick here is that I'm going to refrain from seeing the pieces. So I will be kind of blindfolded, not literally blindfolded. I can see a board, an empty board, and every time we will make a move, I will just see the squares marked with some color. So, oh, yeah, I will. Mm -hmm. Elevated spiritually, yeah? <laughs> well, me neither, me neither. So, uh, um, yeah, sure, let's d dive right into the game. So, yeah, so on the bottom left, if you if you press it and it's saying that uh, you're in sync, then it's supposed to work. Let, let me check. First of all, do you see the arrows that I'm making? Okay, so we're supposed to be in sync, which means that if you make uh, some moves, then I will see them as well. And it will affect both of our boards. But uh, for some reason, I don't... Yeah. All right, so this is the first game. You're playing with the black pieces. Um, yeah, there is a button somewhere. So on the right, there is a, uh, at the bottom below the notation, there is menu. And then on the top left, there is flipboard. Yeah, so I pressed it as well. Um, let's do it for the other board uh, that my viewers can see so they they will see the, the black side. <laughs> well, first of all, most of my viewers are not grandmasters as far as I know. And um, I would evaluate the levels between 1600 and 2300, more or less. And a few players uh, around the level of 2200 told me they actually watched some of our previous streams and uh, learned from it so I was happily surprised so okay so let's start with the first game and see how it goes I haven't done anything like this before so I don't know how it will turn out I just want to mention that if at any point I lose track of the board uh, I hope it won't happen but if it happens I have an, another board where I can just um, for that particular game, uh, look until the end while seeing the pieces before starting the challenge again on the next game. Yeah. So, okay, let's start. So this is the first game you're playing 
with the black pieces. I'm looking from the black side. And I'll try to make the moves according to what I see in the notation. So your opponent played e4. You played e5, yeah? d4. e takes d4. So d4 isn't considered to be the most uh, challenging opening because uh, he gets his queen out early on and uh, can lose a couple of tempi already. So I see you exploited it by playing knight c6 straight away, attacking the queen. Okay, he went queen e3. And I'll, I'll go quickly through the moves until I see a point where I feel like I need to make some remark. Yeah, I don't want to just explain all your moves. Um, yeah. Well, in fact, queen e3 is the actual main move. This, this queen e3 is considered to be the, the most popular continuation. And uh, actually, d6 is not the most precise. Normally, black plays knight f6. Because then if you go, if white goes e5, then there's knight g4. And uh, the queen and the pawn are attacked. So, um, and this isn't good for them. Yeah, normally they go knight c3, and then black goes bishop b4, bishop d2, castles, and white castles long. And uh, at this point, usually after rook e8, it becomes extremely sharp, but uh, from the objective point of view, it should favor black. But it's sort of a gambit opening. Usually they give up the e4 pawn and try to fight for, uh, to, to, to have some attack going. So it's a good idea if you're not an expert uh, on the subtleties, not to enter all the complications. Uh, in general, with gambits, it's better to decline them if you didn't study all the details. So, yeah, so d6. I actually heard Eric Hansen saying it in the blindfold game that you played against him. He was trying to, to gambit some pawns and you avoided it straight away. So, yeah. Yeah, so it was an invitation for a sharp uh, and insane game, which is probably where you are more likely to make mistakes. Uh, and it's, and even if you play against players your own level, it's it's likely because they usually know their way around this this opening and have some experience with the nonsense involved. So um, bishop c4. So d6 basically prevents it's e5 after you develop the knight. So it's a good idea. Now you went knight f6. Okay, from the opening point of view, everything seems normal. And now suddenly your opponent uh, decided uh, it was a good idea to attack you, even though you didn't uh, uh, justify it in any way. Yeah, he took with the bishop on f7, and I think this is a very bad move in general. Just to, I remember growing up, many people played like this, and it's... Uh, I mean, it's a good idea to prevent the opponent from castling, but not in the price of giving up a piece. Now knight g5 check. But I think he... what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, funnily enough, uh, I think like this guy knew that this game was going to be on the stream, because even though it's not necessarily the best move. It's definitely going to make my life harder because uh, the position becomes a bit more uh, more uh, complicated. So I think he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that this game will, will reach the, the stream. So, yeah, yeah. He, against my well-being. So king g8. Now queen b3 check, which would be almost a mate if not for your d pawn. So I guess uh, he, he was a little bit optimistic at this point, but fortunately you have d5. Actually, when now that I think about it, maybe after knight g5 check, maybe it was more precise to go with the king to somewhere like uh, f8. g6 is a little bit exposed. We don't want to go up voluntarily, but uh, I'm thinking maybe uh, back to f8. Could be a little bit safer with no checks in involved. So um, I'm thinking about 
how we could decide between such moves. Generally, uh, this is very concrete. There is no general... <laughs> there, there isn't something that I can say that will be right for all positions where your opponent gives a piece and starts to attack you. You just have to calculate. And a good idea is to to notice uh, his follow-up. So first I'll ask you if, if you saw queen b3 check in advance. Yeah, that's... Yeah, so that's the key idea, and the fact that you saw it is making all the difference. So I think it's a, a good move, but you you have to be aware that uh, the pawn will be pinned, and it might be a risk afterwards if he goes knight c3, for example, here. If you went knight c3, the pawn uh, has to has, has, cannot move, and you cannot really protect it. So you have to play some concrete moves like knight d4 and so on, but... If you foresee that, that you might be fine, then then it's a good idea to go for it. I, I will mention that King G8 also had the advantage that if it was your if it were your move again, then you want to go H6 and King H7, and uh, yeah, and reach safety. So this is a, not bad at all. Queen B3 check, D5. He went castles. I think Knight C3 would be a little bit more challenging, and uh, he. he he kind of didn't uh, follow through with his attack. He kind of gave you a piece and then he continued his development as if nothing happened. So he gave... Yeah, I think now after you play h6, he really doesn't have anything left to do because once the knight goes away, you go with the king to h7 and life is normal again, only your piece up. So... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, like the lesson is mainly from his point of view because he did the main mistakes so far. I cannot point out any big mistakes that you made. Uh, so after h6, I think black is objectively winning already. And uh, well, from his point of view, he should have played knight c3 on the previous move um, after d5. So. Once you have an attack, if you have an initiative and you're leading by development, then a good idea is to, something I like to call striking the iron while it's hot. You don't want to let it cool down and then try to, to find a, an attacking move. So, yeah, so with the initiative it has to happen instantly or it will be gone as if it never existed. So, after h6, let's just quickly go through the moves. E takes d5, which is another mistake because now after queen d5, um, you're attacking, uh, like you're threatening to exchange queens, which will be in your favor, and the knight. I guess, does he have c4? I'm not sure I fully understand the position. I think he, he, could, he can play something like c4, um, which he didn't. I see in the notation he played queen takes d5, but it seems like this would be the, the main chance for him to keep some complexity going. Yeah, so... Yeah, so you cannot take it, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, and okay, it's not really uh, that good for him, but it is something like the, the the last chance, so to speak, because after exchanging queens, it's already, I mean, from from professional point of view, it's already without any hope. Yeah, so. Aha, uh -huh. let me see. Maybe I press something. <laughs> uh huh. Let me see if I can do something with it. Let me try. Okay, what if I press. Okay, I don't know if it makes a difference. Can you hear me now? All well, this, yeah, okay, so I guess we'll have to ask them in a few seconds. So, yeah. 
Uh, I think I know what's the problem. So I'll take a second to fix it. Yeah, that's exactly the point. The desktop uh, audio is gone. So let me fix it. I think I can do it on my own. But uh, I've been wrong before. Yeah, so yeah, desktop audio device and then default. Um, <coughs> okay, so let's see. So, um, so after c4, you miss this move in the game, yeah? The fact that the bishop protects the knight. Yeah, yeah I probably would have taken that, but I think he's he traded off the queens there. Yeah. So, just a moment. I'll connect the headphones again because I changed something earlier. Okay, so now people should hear you just fine. All right, hello, so hello. Tile yeah. stream, hello. There we go. Yes. Okay, sorry. So now after C4, uh, just from objective point of view, I think that to, for you, a move like um, knight d4 would make sense to hit his queen. So you... Even knight a5 actually. Like I'm not too sure. One of these two moves to try and um, gain time before you move your own queen. You don't want it on the diagonal with your king. And then after it moves, you move your queen and you continue the game. Uh, and should be still very good for black but with the queens on the board it's definitely more challenging so okay after queen d5 knight d5 knight f3 it looks really nice for you so let, let's uh, focus on the technique part okay so let's assume that black is already winning you have a piece for a pawn and now see if, how we can treat the, the the this part of the game yeah do you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so now after knight f3, um, I'll use the same method we always uh, mentioned in the streams. What does he want? Uh, as far as I can imagine, <laughs> nothing. He just wants to develop his pieces, right? Yeah, but no, no uh, materialistic threat or direct threat that I can... I, I want to say that I can see, but that I can visualize. So bishop f5 feels like the, the logical uh, developing move because you just bring another piece to the center and you're also hitting a pawn on c2. So uh, it feels like uh, a really good uh, idea. And uh, if, just, if he doesn't threaten anything, then the follow-up will be probably something like king f7 and putting your rooks in the open files in the center. And, um, so king f7 because once the queens are off the board it's better to get your king towards the center right exactly it's already becoming a valuable piece in itself uh, that you shouldn't necessarily protect uh, you can use it as if uh, it's one of the of the strong pieces uh, that you can uh, utilize so you want to bring it to the center um, but still keep in mind that it's there, there are possibilities to attack your king if it's uh, if there are many pieces in the center as well. So it's just a general rule, but you have to use it with uh, some common sense. Yeah. So bishop f5. Now he played knight bd2. I like the fact that you didn't take the pawn, even though it looks tempting. I'm not sure if he can punish you for it, but uh, I like the idea of uh, finishing the development first. The, yeah, that felt like it was stronger to me. Yeah, and there, you don't mm. risk anything. The pawn will still be there, and you will improve your position. So now king f7, as mentioned, you played king h7. He played c4, knight db4. Um, obviously, you noticed his threat. You wanted to go to the most active square, as we talked in the streams. You want to move forward, so this was a well, good idea. Yeah, I had your voice in the back of my head saying, yeah, go forward, baby. man. Don't That's go what backwards. I want to hear. <laughs> so <laughs> now uh, a4... This kind of moves makes me suspect even more that he knew about this stream and he just wants to confuse me because it will be much easier for me to follow the position if, if all the moves would make sense and this move I cannot really <laughs> make sense of. So I will probably forget the pawn is there later on. I'm guessing he wants to lift his rook or something. I'm not, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, he probably wants rook a3, but uh, it doesn't strike me as the most straightforward way to develop it. Um, I used to do it when I was like six, seven years old, uh, maybe 
probably s when I just started to play chess, I wanted to, to develop the rooks like this until someone explained that it's not the way for the rooks to, to join the game. Well, actually, you know, maybe the reason why he did that is because if he didn't do that, if you just back it up one, Mm -hmm. So if I back it up one there, sure. now if I hit him like on the next move, like let's say he does something inconsequential like that. If I hit him with that, and then you know what I mean, like wait, I don't wait. know, maybe <laughs> he was. I'm looking at the notation. So h3, knight c2, rook b1, yeah, and now knight d4 uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe he just didn't like the 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 knight and the bishop kind of teaming up on his rook over there, so he yeah, just yeah. wanted to get it out of there. It's a good idea, and I think now you can play something like knight to d4, and. Uh, he has to go back with the rook, and you kind of centralize your knight with tempo. So yeah. It's probably... But this is why I would play something like a3. So here, from white's po point of view, a3 is a good move, because now knight c2, rook a2, and uh, he wants to maybe go b4 later and be a little bit active. Well, there you go. Yeah. And if you go a5 to prevent it, then he goes b3. So anyway, he will develop his rook at some point, but a3 and rook a2 are is much more logical. So now, rook ad8 uh, is good. You want to develop to the open file. And this is the right rook, because had you put the other rook, you wouldn't have a place for the a8 rook. Yeah? Yeah. So this is the good, the right direction. Now he played h3. Still no threat. And uh, you're asking yourself which piece doesn't work. And um, probably the answer is... Uh, my, my uh, age rook there. Your age rook. I see in the notation that you played knight d3, but um, I mean, it, it is a good move activating the knight, but just keep in mind in general that no, I mean, almost always, even if you improve your piece a lot with one move, if it doesn't gain material immediately, then it's, it's not as good as bringing another piece. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to get that bishop off the board. At this point, I figured I'm a piece up, so let's just trade down. Yeah, but all the principles are, are are the same even when you're a piece up. Because bringing another rook, imagine right now the rook is not in the game, and after the move he will join the the forces. So you're, you're yeah. bringing a full rook into the game. And knight d3 is not even bringing a knight. He's taking a knight and improves it a bit. So uh, just from the, let's call it uh, the energy management point of view it it would be kind of it wouldn't maximize the effect of the move on, on the position so unless of course the knight creates some direct threats and you gain material and so on so um knight d3 doesn't strike me as something that gain material but it does attack the bish so i'll forgive you for it so i wanted to disrespect his bish yeah, with yeah. that move but that's I true doing. that's true so it's not a bad move, as mentioned. You can play rook e8 on the next move, but just keep in mind, I like development uh, even uh, at grandmaster level. It's a good idea to be disciplined and follow the development uh, principles where, strictly. So okay. b3, knight xc1. Seems I mean, if you say a, then you might as well say b. Rook ac1, and now you played bishop g5. Hmm. <clears throat> so. I'm yeah, thinking. I'm just forcing the trades at this point. In my mind, I'm like, let's just trade it down. So the same idea I mentioned earlier still is valid. I want to play rook e8, yeah? Yeah. And um, just to maybe even bishop f6 later. And the bishops are very active. I don't want to allow him to exchange a knight for the bishop. I don't care that I'm a piece up. The bishop is more valuable. And it's also like All doubling right. your pawns a little bit. So, yeah. So bishop g5, I would consider a slight inaccuracy. But... Um, okay, it's not changing the evaluation too much, but still, rook e8 followed by bishop f6 would be far more uh, damaging for him. So now okay. took, right. you took knight f3. Okay, and we'll go through the rest of the game relatively faster, uh, because I feel like uh, the the main part is behind us. So yeah, we don't we don't have to spend too much more time on this game. It was more just like getting out of that getting out of that opening. Yeah. <laughs> When people play e5, e4, e5, and then d4, mm -hmm. I always that 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 opening intimidates me for some reason. Yeah, <clears throat> playing from the black end of it. That's true. E4, e5, and then d4. It it feels like uh, they are trying to attack you. But uh, remember that uh, if they break the rules, then 
you should have some form of advantage there. So the fear is very rewarding. So okay. when, yeah. usually when you know all the basic principles and your opponent still somehow managed to, to pose some fear, it means they're doing probably something that you're not familiar with, which is usually good for you. So uh, here, okay, I want to, to go through the moves relatively quickly. Let's see. So at least the viewers will get uh, like the experience of how the game ended. Sure. Um, and I'll try to follow. I'm not sure if I'll manage to do it quickly, but let's see. G4. So H takes G4. Bishop takes G4. Knight G5 check. King G6. It all makes a lot of sense. F4 protecting the knight. And now, okay, you played rook H5. I guess you want to double the rooks. Um, yes. But from <clears throat> my point of view, I feel like it's a good idea to just... Uh, uh, ask yourself again. I guess you did ask yourself which piece doesn't work, and and you wanted to bring the d8 rook to the h file, yeah. Yeah, but I was just thinking about doubling up those rooks on the h file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I still see the position uh, entirely, but a move I would consider is rook d2, and uh, my idea is to to play something like uh, let me put it on the board, rook d2. And maybe just play knight d4 net later and try to activate your pieces. Yeah? Yeah, so okay. Rook h5 in itself is not an active move. It's preparing an active move. So I feel like this is a little bit more energetic. But still, rook f1, it seems to have worked uh, decently in the game. You double the rooks. Knight e4. Um, I don't think he's attacking anything. So knight b4 looks logical. Now rook c3. Yeah. Threatening the fork on those rooks there. He yeah, addressed yeah. that. Yeah. You want to go knight d3. So he, he goes rook c3. Rook h1 check. King f2. Exchanging another piece, which is good for you. By the way, if anyone uh, wa is watching and doesn't understand why exchanging is good for the side who is leading, just imagine... Um, I don't know what sport is the most popular in the US, but... Uh, Probably football. Probably football. Say football. Imagine two players versus one, as opposed to 10 players versus nine in football. So yes. uh, two versus one is the same difference between the players, but it's a much bigger advantage. They can just pass the ball between each other and the guy will never catch them. And it's kind of similar in chess. When you have two pieces versus one, the advantage is relatively much bigger. So... Yeah, now rook e8. And, uh, well, I really uh, feel like I, I'm not seeing the entire board anymore. But uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice position to have. And uh, you're attacking the knight on e4, if I'm not wrong. This is true. So now he plays rook e3. And I feel like he missed this. Yeah, knight c2 check. I see in the notation. So you're attacking the rook but... on e3 and the king on e1. And fortunately for me, just as I stop uh, following everything, then the game is practically finished. So, game comes to a swift end, yeah. We don't need to finish it out. It's no, pretty uh, elementary. You can just that. go through the, the moves without explaining. Uh, mm -hmm. I like the idea of the viewers uh, getting a somewhat uh, closure with the game, yeah? Okay, so, all right. Okay. And without notation. Also in chess books, they, they do this. They, they let you see the last 10, 15 moves without any notation. So <laughs> it's funny. I'm, I I I'm imagining the the position. I think I can follow it, but okay. I think you're a rook and a bishop up, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So now you took, and he decided it was enough. Okay. So overall, no overall a good game. And uh, Look, you're saying in that in those in that instance, it's better to to bring more pieces into the fold rather than maybe gra grab one pot of material or. Uh, trade down or something like that. Bring the, bring the rook out. Don't leave the rook on the h, on the h square the whole game. On the h square. Um, well, in this particular case, you had an open file, so it was kind of justified. But the events that uh, that led to creating that open file were not precise. So, in a way, if I could give you just one main uh, advice out of this game is that you want to follow the the open the development rules 
very strictly. You want to invest one move in each piece and you don't want to move another piece voluntarily until you've uh, invested at least one move uh, at all your pieces, yeah? Okay, all right, all right. So I'll try to remember that. I will remember that the next time I get on and start playing. Yeah, and of course you can move twice if he is threatening you, but usually if they have no threats, you don't want to voluntarily move the same one. And sometimes, I mean, in, in very... Uh, in a lot of the cases, they, they do punish you for it when you're not a piece up.